and just say after me, Father God in heaven, let your word be in my mind. Let your word be in my heart. Let your word be on my lips. And most importantly, let your grace show in my life. Amen and amen. amen. This is Exodus 3, chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. And here we see a picture of Moses. He's tending the flock. He's shepherding for his uh, father, Jethro, um, who was a priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And then we see that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Well, I think sometimes we have these kind of God encounters, but there's not many of us that can say we've seen burning bushes. Um, it must have been quite interesting. And at the same time, once you kind of realize what's happening, it would have been quite bizarre and you can see that obviously when God spoke to him out of the bush that he really got quite uh, worried um, he says I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush does not burn so the inquisitiveness was there to see God working and I think this is what happens sometimes when we are before we become believers there is this sense of we don't know God but there is this sense that when we see God working when we when we come to the to the presence of God and find that God suddenly reaches down and touches us in some way and it may be by something that happens with someone else it could be someone getting healed it could be someone changing their life I remember when I got saved that my best friends um, you know asked me to come around for dinner that week because I said I you know, met with God and you know I'd, I'd got saved and you know and they were, they were really inquisitive. So they invited me around for dinner. I'd go around for dinner and they like, go, tell me what's happened. You know, what's going on? What's, what have you done? What's, what's happened? How did God do this? And I said, look, I don't know. All I know is that I'm going to follow God for the rest of my life because I've got so much peace and joy and love in my heart that I just know that I know that I've had this really amazing encounter with God. And they then came to church and eventually got saved. In fact, they're pastors now, which is another story. But, you know, this is what happens. Sometimes God does something amazing with someone around us or he might do something amazing in our own life and it brings us to him. We suddenly are rea realizing the presence of God. And, and in this situation, God speaks to him out of this bush. I mean, how bizarre is that? It's incredible. And uh, he said, Moses, Moses, he called him in verse 4. And he said, here I am. I, I don't know if I'd be saying here I am. I'd probably be running away, I think, at that point without knowing God. Um, and then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. And I think this is, this is the start of our real understanding of the holiness of God. That God is holy. And that none of us have any right to consider ourselves righteous before God. None of us. We all have sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. If we've only failed at one part of the law, if we've only sinned one little tiny part of the law, it's as if we've broken the whole of the law. So we have sinned. We are sinners. And we come to God as a God who's holy. And this is where we start. This is until we recognize that we're sinners, we don't need a savior. And so it's really important that we get to this point of realizing that when we're coming into the presence of God, when we're dealing with God, then we're dealing with someone who is holy and we're coming into holy ground. We are coming before God, before God's throne, and it's holy ground. And we cannot stand unless we come in the way that God's called us. Fortunately for Moses, God was calling him there to service. And he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he wasn't totally ignorant of this God. And yet at the same time, you know, how much of it was his God and how much of it was just handed down to him by his, by his parents, by, you know, by his forebears, if you like. Those people before him had a relationship with God. 
But it says Moses, in verse 6, it says Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Imagine, he's just worried to death about God's presence. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to do a, a good and large land to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And verse 9 says, Now therefore behold the cry of the children of Israel has come to me and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. So now he's calling him to service. So he's actually presents himself before Moses. He's come to Moses. Moses hasn't come to God. God has come to Moses. And this is what happens. God calls us. God comes to us. We can't do it in our strength. We cannot go to God in our strength and think that we can come to God and be right with God. If we do good things and we do enough good things and don't do enough bad things, that doesn't mean to say we can come before God because that's not his way. He says, Come now therefore and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now obviously this was a massive calling on, on Moses' life. And you know, it's not something that's going to be repeated. It was something major. And God, Moses was the man that God had chosen for that particular work. But Moses says to God, and this is where the humility comes, we've got to humble ourselves before Almighty God. We cannot come to God in arrogance and rudeness. We have got to come to God in humility. And so he says, you know, who am I <laughs> that I should uh, go to Pharaoh? You know, Pharaoh was like a god to the people at that time. So who am I to go to Pharaoh that I should bring to Pharaoh the, the children of Israel out uh, and ask him to t let me take them out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you and this sh sign shall be a sign that you have, I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of the Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. So he's giving him a sign that when he does do that, he's going to serve God on this mountain, on the mountain of Horeb. And then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And of course, from, from then on, there was this element where the people of God were not able to say, Yahweh's name. They called him Yahweh because they were not allowed to say his name. But it's I am. He is the God who is, you know, timeless. He's the God that has always been there and he is just God. He is the one true God. Um, and he says in verse 15, he says, Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever and this is my memorial to all generations. So he's telling him, this is, this is what your calling is. This is the work I've got you to do. You know, the fact that he was humble before God. This is obviously something important. We must humble ourselves before God. We must realize that without God we're nothing. We can't come to God. God comes to us. God touches us. It's all a work of grace. When we're saved by God and we're saved from ourselves, we're saved from the flesh, then it's all God's work. It's all a work of grace. And the minute we start to think that we've done it or that we are, there's something special about us or we can be self-righteous because we think we're holy, then right there we've kind of fallen short of, of what we really need to understand. That without Jesus we are nothing. But with Jesus, with the work of Jesus Christ in us, we are no longer worms. We are no longer um, just servants. You know, We are no longer sinners. We become saints in the kingdom of God. We become sons and daughters. We become princes and princesses in the kingdom because we become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So when we pray, 
It's as if Jesus is praying because we are part of the kingdom. When we're praying in his name, it's as if he's, we are praying, it's as if we're praying as Jesus prayed. And so God hears our prayers and God answers our prayers. And that's why Jesus said, you will do much greater things than I. Because through his authority and his name, we are elevated from being below Satan and the, uh, yeah, and, and the, the, the evil uh, host that he has. We are actually elevated when we're born again of the Holy Spirit and we become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are elevated to the courts of heaven and we are over Satan at that point because we're in the authority and we're in a position of being children of God's kingdom before we were children of Satan. But when we are saved, we are elevated and we become higher than the angels. Wow, what an amazing God we have. But we don't do it by obeying the law. We don't get there by being self-righteous. We don't get there by being able to keep the law because the law is something that causes us to fall down because of our our fallen nature, we automatically fall down. We're not perfect. Even though we're saved, even though we're elevated above the angel, we're not perfect. We are only able to live and only able to live out a life of, of really pleasing God by the law of love, which comes through um, Jesus Christ. And so therefore Jesus says, you know, these are the two laws. This is the Ten Commandments summed up in two. The first four is about loving God. And the second six is about loving your neighbor. So, so long as we follow the law of love and we continue to do the do's, then the don'ts tend to take care of themselves. And we become a different person. We have a new heart. We have a different nature. So we don't have to get hu- hit up with all the little you know, paraphernalia, all the details of, you know, oh, I've done this wrong and I've done that. The whole point is to keep your eyes on Jesus and apply God's word to your life and things will start to work out and God will be pleased because you are actually doing your, your best to please God. And the Holy Spirit will certainly let you know. He will convict you of sin and let you know if you're doing anything wrong. You won't have your peace. You'll lose your peace. You'll lose that joy if you're doing the opposite to what God wants you to do. But the whole point is you're not doing it for the rules and regulations of keeping the law. You are actually pleasing God by loving God and loving your neighbor and showing that love by how you apply his word to your life with other people. No one can love God and hate his brother. And that's where we come to when we look at Romans. 